I am going to be doing some live coding in this talk. A lot of live coding, actually, so I hope you're up for that. Um, it's interesting to do it in a cinema, because live coding is always a bit of a tightrope walk. If I crash and die, you've got very comfy seats to watch my death in. And, you know, you can just pretend it's a low-budget Bond film or something. That will... Um, so, let me tell you a story. Years ago, I um, had a startup with some friends of mine. I'm not that old. A few years ago, not, not, not like loads of years ago. And um, we had that rare thing in a startup in that we'd actually launched the product into the world and started to get customers. And we were starting to make money, which is very satisfying. So one quiet Friday afternoon, I hacked together this thing just because it was interesting. We were interesting. Our startup was working, right? So I hacked together this thing that would show us how much stuff we'd sold. We had um, a gold business, and you know we were gradually starting to sell some gold. So I hacked together this web page that would show people total sales since the startup began. And I wanted it to be a web page because I wanted everyone in the organisation to be able to see. And it was fun, and that number grew. And you know, on a quiet day, you'd mash refresh, and it would jump up a little bit. On a busy day, you'd mash refresh, and it would jump up quite a lot. It was a nice motivating thing. Um, but it was it was hacked together in an afternoon, and it was never great. It was basically not much more than an SQL query spitting out HTML tags. It's fairly horrible. It got slower and slower as the database grew and grew. I always wanted to go back and rewrite it, but I never had the chance because it was it was just below that mission critical line. It was the nice to have. Um, tell them I'm not in. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, as a way of demonstrating a few different technologies, and as a way of revisiting this wart in my past career, we're going to build a live dashboard streaming sales for a fictional company. So, here we go. Man diving headlong into lines of code. That's me. So, can everyone see that font size, especially at the back? Of course you can. It's a cinema. It's a huge screen. This is great. So, I have, just to prove there's nothing up my sleeve, I have this completely empty directory, right? So where should we start? I am going to make a server directory, and I am going to, I think in another window, I'm going to start here. Uh, MP MPX, the node package manager executory thing, create React app. And the reason I'm doing that first is it takes ages. So hopefully sometime by the time we reach that point in the talk, it will have finished running. Oh no, I forgot to type client. There we go. Okay, so we'll leave that running. First thing I'm going to do is connect to the database, and this is a Kafka database. And I'm going to show you that I've... So imagine this is our production database, or hopefully a read-only copy or something. And I have got sales happening in the organization. Here we go. This part's fiction, but you can imagine it would be a real company streaming um, this endless list of sales. Um, it's all dummy data, but the price is what we're interested in. Can we turn that into a dashboard in less than a lunchtime's worth of coding? That's the question. So, hopefully we can without too many hiccups. We'll start by um, summarizing that data, right? Kafka's kind of an interesting database because it kind of behaves like an event, it behaves a lot like an event stream. It also behaves a bit like a relational database in that you have series of facts ever growing in time, but you can also very easily summarize those facts into the state of the world that you're interested in. So I can do something like create, oh, hang on. Uh, I am going to, I think I might have, give me one second, because I think I might have an old version of this talk already running. So, ignore this bit, it never happened. Told you it was a tightrope walk, there we go, okay. So, I am going to create uh, a table that summarizes that stream of purchases. I'm going to call it dashboard and I'm going to create it with a select query. So select the sum of the price of things we've sold as the total. From that stream of purchase data, 
I need to group it because um, aggregate queries always need a group by clause. I don't have a natural grouping key, so I'm just going to make one up. Uh, yeah. So that should give me a summary, okay? And that little query runs in the background, gradually updating that database, uh, that table. So if I select star from dashboard, I get the total. And if I do it again and again, you should see it gradually grows, right? Now, I've worked at companies where that's it, we're finished. If marketing wants to know the sales totals, they better learn SQL, because no one's going to give them any more help. I think we can be a bit more friendly than that. So we have this stream of purchases going in. We have a summary. Uh, the next thing to realize is that an interesting thing about Kafka, every table which summarizes the state of the world can also be seen as a, a series of events, right? We've got this static table, what's our total? We can also look at it as, is it, can, we, can you give me a stream of the total updating in real time? which is really easy. We just do select star from dashboard, emit changes, and now it becomes itself a stream of summary data. That's what we're going to need to hook into in order to build this dashboard. Okay? So it's, so it's this one row static table, but we're almost subscribing to it to see the changes in real time. So I will stop there. That's it for the database. Next step, we need to go into that server directory and write, I'm going to write a WebSocket server, because I think the WebSocket server is the right choice for live streaming data, right? I'm going to do it in Python. Any Python programmers here? You can critique my Python code afterwards. Thank you. Um, write it to dev now. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with the virtual environment. Um, and I always call them M, but that's a bit boring, so let's call it GoTo for this. Start up an isolated Python environment, and I will say source. Can you see the code at the bottom, yeah? I'm not that tall, I'm not blocking it, good. Source, go to um, bin, activate, and now we have an isolated Python environment. So, we need a few packages here. I'm, I've said I'm going to write a WebSocket server, so we need the uh, the WebSocket package. I know I'm going to need some JSON wrangling, so I'm going to pull in simple JSON, and I'm connecting to a Kafka database, so I'm going to use the Confluent Kafka um, drivers. Let's install that, and we can start to write some Python code. Okay. On to an actual editor. Here we go. Uh, so, usual preamble, user bin m python. How do you write a WebSocket server in Python that connects to a Kafka database? Let's split it up into two bits. Let's start with a WebSocket server. So, to write a WebSocket server, I'm going to define an asynchronous main function, which says, um, a we uh, sorry, async with a WebSocket server, And I need to give it a function that handles each client as it connects. So let's just call that handle connection. And I tell it where to bind to, and I give it a port. Could you, yeah, let's actually, let's just do that for now, because that will be illustrative. Import WebSockets, and then we're in a slightly different world with asynchronous functions. So instead of just calling main directly, I need to call it like that. But other than that, that's pretty good import async io and let's define this function the connection handler i'm not going to do much with this for now but we'll, we'll gradually expand it out connection handler in this library takes two arguments the first is the connection itself and the second is the uri path that the client asked for which we're going to ignore for the sake of this and i'm just going to say um, when we get that Let's just send a message, hello world. Now nah, it's boring. Hello go to, how about that? Much better. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, hang on. Uh, so, oh yeah, so the thing I need to add in here, we are starting up the WebSocket server and doing what? 
at the moment there isn't anything really to do, but we don't want it to finish. We need this WebSocket server to just stay up, doing nothing, listening for, for connections. So I'm going to do this little async trick to make it just hang there, waiting on a future that never gets filled. And that should give me an absolutely bare bones Python WebSocket server. Let's have a look. Shouldn't say anything, but if I connect to it, there's a really useful tool for testing WebSocket servers. This is like an aside tip. WS, if you've ever used Telnet to connect to networking systems or curl to test HTTP servers, WS is your equivalent for WebSocket servers. And you can just say that. And that's the absolute minimal WebSocket client. Hello, go to. It connects and it closes com immediately. So what should we do next? I'm going to start by throwing in that same trick to make the client stay open indefinitely. And then I think that's all I need for the WebSocket server at this stage. So the next step is to connect to the database and start getting that interesting data so we can start sending it out to people. For that, I'm going to need to define a function that runs what's called a consumer. Um, in Kafka parlance, a consumer is just a read-only connection to the database. I am going to run that consumer um, this way. I'm going to say a consumer is, I happen to know that the particular class I need is a deserializing consumer. And you just configure it, right? And at this point, this is kind of boilerplate stuff. We'll tell the consumer to subscribe to one source of data in Kafka, and that's going to be our dashboard. And then once we've done that, we'll go into a loop and say, this consumer is going to look for new data every 200 milliseconds and get a message, and I will deal with that message somehow. So. Connecting to the database, asking for messages, trying to get it into a WebSocket server. We're gradually building this out. There are two things to do to make this sort of start working. The first is we need to deal with that configuration. And the other is we need to deal with the message. Configs, um, let's go with the message. So uh, the message can be one of three things. It could be none, as in there's no new data. There's no new, to no new total. There's no new sale made, so there's nothing to say. And in that case, I am not going to get fancy. I'm just going to say print waiting. So we've got some feedback for the talk. It may be an error. And yeah, um, if it's an error, again, I'm not going to do anything fancy here. I'm just going to say, uh, let's just print it to the screen. That's fine for now. OK, but what we're really hoping is that it's an interesting message. And I'm going to say, in that case, the value that we want to see is that message's value. And for now, let's print that to the screen. Right, there we go. So that's enough handling for now. Let's import that class and think about configuration. Configuration with databases, it's always boilerplate, but let's go through it. You need to tell it where the database can be found. Um, and in that, in the case of Kafka, the magic keyword is bootstrap servers. I happen to have one running on my local machine at 1992, I think. Um, the next thing you need to do, and this is very Kafka specific, you need to give it a group ID. Kind of outside the scope of this talk, but a group ID lets you say, I am part of a group of, of readers and I want to share the work among us. So it's good for parallelism, partitioning, work sharing. Doesn't apply here, so any sort of fixed string will do just fine. I think I will go with a UUID. Okay? Anything will do. Um, and the last thing I need to do is configure it with how to, when you get these bytes coming across the network, how do you turn it into a Python object? And for that, you need to specify the value deserializer. This is particularly hard to type live in front of an audience when you're English, but it's written in American English. So I'm trying to do that without 
typos. The default serialization format in Kafka is something like something called Avro, which is a lot like Google Pro, Google's Proto Buffs, if you know that. Um, the main difference to me is that I think Avro does a better job of thinking about migrations as your data schema changes. How do you migrate that? You can use Protobuf with Kafka. But I am using the Kafka Deserializer. Yes. Uh, yes, let's import that. And I'm going to configure that with a schema registry, which is uh, a thing that tells it where to find the descriptions of objects so that it can deserialize them into Python. I have to dis define that schema registry as, um, oh no, sorry, that's, not, yeah. So, sorry, I've got that slightly wrong. I need to define a serializer. Yeah. And that, almost there, that's what I meant to type, sorry. So my serializer is an Avro serializer. It connects to a schema registry, registry client, and I need to tell it where to find the schema registry, which is, you know, when you create a database table in, say, Postgres, it registers the schema internally. It, you know, this, the description of the table. Kafka does the same, except the, scre the uh, schema server is separate. You can run it on, dif on a different machine if you want to. I am running it locally on port. I really hope I've got the right port there. Yes, I think so. So, a couple of imports. And I think, uh, what have I done wrong there? Comma. Yeah, I think so. Just format that up nicely. So I'm configuring a consumer. I'm connecting to the database. I'm polling my dashboard table. I'm going to print it out. Hopefully, if I rerun that, we should either see some data coming through or have a debugging issue. I do have some notes in my high wire act. What have I missed out? Uh, da, 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 da. Um, I don't. I don't know what's missing yet. It may. Let's just. It's a good question that we should. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I haven't called that function anywhere. That's what I'm missing. Right. It's good enough to define how to connect, but you ought to say please connect. Right. So. The, um, that's not running as an asynchronous function, so I have to kind of give it its own thread to run in. So I'm going to get the uh, main, I'm going to get the event loop from there, and I'm going to say run this kind of in a thread, run it in an executor with no thread pool, and I'm going to say run consumer. There we go. And what I probably should have done is, let's say that, starting consumer. How about that? So if I do that, starting consumer, with a bit of luck, no. <gasps> Let's just check that we are getting data from the dashboard. So what's gone wrong? I am connecting to, ah, my schema registry URL is wrong. That's what I've done, it's 8081, sorry. And I'm printing out the value. Ah, no. What have I done wrong? Awkward silence. Um, poll for consumer print. None of us have tried to find it. I am. Um, Oh, let me just see if I should put it in there. Oh, okay, that's better. Um, yeah, and that's a typo. Sorry, I was just starting it off in the wrong place. There we go. Phew! <laughs> okay, we have some data coming through. 
thank you for the one guy that applauded my recovery there. I'm going to buy you a drink later. Okay, we're, we're getting closer. Let me just zoom that up a little bit. Um, I think the next thing to do is we've got this um, object and it's time to turn that into some actual JSON. So let's say that the formatted version of that value is simple JSON dot dump to a string the value. Change that to the formatted one and import simple JSON, which we installed earlier. I think I'll do one other thing because it's bothering me is I'll just install a quick signal handler. So when I hit control C, I can say signal dot sig diff, uh, let me get some autocomplete going on there. Right, that should mean that when I kill it off, I don't get that from now on. Okay, so run that and Jason, we're nearly there, I promise you. Right. I can run a WebSocket server. I can uh, have clients connect and I can wait and keep them opening while I send some messages, in theory. I can connect to the database and I'm streaming out the data. I can check how I'm doing for time. and It's actually not so terrible. We still have time left in our lunch break to finish this dashboard. Um, I'm probably making you hungry, especially as this is the slot before lunchtime talking about lunch break hacking. But hey. We can, we can generate some um, anticipation for lunch. So, how, what's the next bit? The next bit is to get from this printing to the screen to actually sending it to the um, clients, right? This, I've done this a couple of times in Java, and this is, I find this interesting. In Java, it's really, really easy to start a WebSocket server. It's much harder to broadcast to all your connected clients. In Python, I find there's a bit of machinations to get the WebSocket server going, but broadcast is actually pretty easy. All we need to do is, instead of printing that to the screen, we say WebSocket.broadcast. Uh, slow down. Um, and we tell it which clients we want to broadcast to, and we then send it our string, right? So the only question there is, where has this, broad this client thing? come from. I'm not going to be able to create it there, so let's pass it in as an argument. And how do you pass in an argument something running in an executor? You do not do it like that. You have to pass it in separately so that the function can get sent to another thread or whatever it is and then start it running there. So when you're calling this run in executor thing, you supply the arguments that way. Then we could say our clients is just a set. And I would like to pass that. This isn't going to work. But that's basically semantically what I'd like to do. I'd like to pass it to handle connection so that as we get a new client, we can add it in. So in theory, this is what I'm doing. Handle connection with clients. When they connect, I'm going to do clients.add this connection. And we're good. The only problem with that is I've just violated the contract for this callback function. Handle connection takes two arguments, connection and path. So I can fix that with something from Funk Tools called partial. Any functional programmers in the audience? A few, not that kind of partial, different partial. Um, this is, uh, it takes, this is uh, curry, right? This takes a function and says, I'm going to give you some of the arguments now. Give me back a function that will take the rest of the arguments later. So I'm going to use f partial to take the first thing, clients, now. Then it goes back to fit fitting in with the API for WebSocket serve. Okay. So that should be good. Uh, yeah, let's see. Let's see what we've got to. It's running. It's not crashing. It's still getting data from the database. Let's, let's kill that off for now. And let's run our WS command again. Hopefully, this is going to say hello world and then whatever it's saying up at the top. Yes, there we go. We've got a working WebSocket server that's streaming data from a database in about 22 minutes. OK, uh, let's just prove that's actually like multi-client proper WebSocket server, right? Um, they're all getting updates. Whoever's connected gets an update. So 
We're almost done with the Python bit. I, I, there are a couple of changes I'd like to make to this. The big thing that bothers me is I've got a race condition on this client set, right? Um, I could be writing to this here, sorry, I could be reading from the list of clients up here while I'm adding a new one down here, and that's going to give me an exception. There are a few ways to deal with that. I'm going to choose the easy one. I'm going to say, give me a lock um, from threading.lock. Import that. And I'm just going to pass that lock around. And whenever I'm reading from it, you can't write to it. And whenever you write to it, you can't read from it. Just block that out. So I will need to pass the lock up to my two functions. Go up here and take that lock. Go up here and get it in the right place. And then I can just say, um, with lock, it's quite nice the semantics around getting a lock and acquiring it and releasing it in Python. With that lock, block anyone else out, add the connection, release the lock. And over here, with that lock, block anyone else out, read the clients, release the lock. That should be fine for the kind of internal dashboard scale we're talking about. And with that, let's just double check that still runs, but I think that's what we want to, to do. One more thing I'd like to do, I've got a mixture of hello go to and JSON. That's annoying, so let's just take that out. Okay, so there's no connection message anymore. That should make writing the front end easier. Okay, that's it, web tier, database tier. We must now go into the dark and scary regions of JavaScript. Certain members of the audience need to brace themselves. I've done this talk before, like at the when the they give out free beers and then there's one more talk at the conference. Some people find that a little easier. Sorry, JavaScript people, I love you. I'm just teasing. Shouldn't do that, bad person. Uh, okay, so. We'll leave the web server happily running like that. I now have a client, and the client is a JavaScript React app. Um, I'm just going to keep it in JavaScript. I, honestly, I slightly prefer TypeScript, but let's keep things simple. Um, so I have started with a template thing, and it tells me if I do yarn start, it will start running a React app. And while that's happening, if you recall right at the start with the Kafka um, KSQL bit, we have this stream of purchases coming in. And every time we get a purchase, we add it to our running total and make that the new state of the dashboard table. And then you can watch that state of the dashboard table and get the latest live information just because it's rolling up events as they come in. Interestingly, React works very, very similarly to that in that we are going to connect to the web server and every time we get a new message, we're going to, we're going to add it to our existing state in the web app and just look at that state that's been rolled up over time and print it to the screen somehow. So the code looks very different, but semantically exactly the same thing is happening in React, which is cool because you don't need too many mental models. One mental model fewer is a good thing. So inside this template app, uh, you get app.js, which is your starting point. That's all I'm going to use. And over here, I will try and get autocomplete working. Audience is divided between people who think Emacs doesn't have autocomplete and people who think having to get it working is a bit weird. And fellow Emacs users, yes. <laughs> OK, so this code, if you squint, you can see that this thing is being generated by these tags, right? Let's take out that Learn React link and think about how we're going to build this. The first thing I'll do is define a constant, which is where to find the WebSocket server. And it is running at, did I say 8080? I think I did. Okay. And I'm going to create a new WebSocket client, which I'll just call WS, new WebSocket with that URL. Okay. Now, I said we're going to be managing the state of this app. So how do you do that? Well, you, imp oh, 
Where did that go? Never mind. I shall recreate it as I talk. Um, how do you create this piece of state that React deals with? Right? You do it like this. You import use state. Very nice little function they didn't have in the early days of React, but they have now, which makes it easy to say, I would like to use a piece of state and its initial value, I think in this case, I will make it the string watting, waiting. The string waiting, right? That use state function defines an area in memory where the state of the app can live, or at least a piece of it. And it gives you back two things. It gives you the current value of that bit of state, which I'm going to call message, and it gives you a setter. So you can update it. Right? OK, with that, I think what I'll do for this is just say, when you create the app, take that WebSocket server and say, whenever you get a message in, this is how you handle that event. You run this function. And that function should, well, let's see what we've actually got to deal with. So let's call console.log that event, OK? So that should connect to my server um, and log it to the screen. And let's say that eventually that message we've defined is going to get to the screen there. That should be nice, OK? Uh, oh, I've got the wrong protocol there. That should be WS, not HTTP. Uh, Semicode. Oh, thank you. No, WS, not. Ah. Going to check my notes. Didn't want to have to do that twice. That should be OK. Uh, okay, let's do this the old-fashioned way. What is WebSocket if it isn't doesn't have a non-message thing? There we go. It totally does, my friend. It hasn't. Oh, I know what I've done wrong. Sorry, I should be assigning it, not calling it. That's what I've done wrong. OK, sorry about that. You can tell it's real, right? A few mistakes make it more real. That's why all these mistakes are deliberate. Honest. OK, so we're connecting to the web server. And um, we're getting this message event thing back, which is part of the browser API, I guess. Um, and it has a data thing here. And that's the bit we're interested in, right? So let's start off by doing that. Let's call set message with uh, event data. And there we go. We're almost there. That's starting to look like a live dashboard, right? The one guy who gave me a round of applause. Can I have a round of applause for that? Thank you. Oh, that, I wasn't fishing for that at all. Thank you. <laughs> OK. So this is almost right. I think we can do a bit better than this, OK? And we've got time to. So this is a string, which is JSON. Let's tidy it up a bit. That event data is actually a raw string. If we do json.parse, we should get an object, uh, which is that. Uh, let's not call it message. Let's call it something equally descriptive like that we use. OK, so that value is now a parsed piece of JSON. And we can say that the total is uh, that field. Yeah? And that total is a number. So we could get kind of nice and say the formatted version of that is um, total dot to locale string. EN, really remembering the API here because there's no type checking or anything. Uh, minimum fraction digits, I think, is the magic object you have to supply. And that should give me that. So now I can set my message to the formatted version. 
I can come down here and add a dollar symbol in, and with a bit of luck, there we go. That's it, a live dashboard in, including my preamble, call it half an hour. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, that's it. And I, I used to enjoy lunchtime hacks a lot when I was um, when I was really in the trenches. And if you can go down to the, this is a very British thing, perhaps. If you can get down to the sandwich shop, grab a sandwich, come back and build something before your allotted hour is up, you're kind of in the wrong job that they, you're monitoring that hour so closely. But it is fun to be able to build things quickly, right? And if it's just internal. Obviously, this isn't like production ready for a million customers showing up tomorrow. But if it's just internal, you have made it so that the people in marketing and HR and anyone in the organization can quickly access the data you'd like to show them. You can knock up um, a live streaming dashboard to some weird quirky system that doesn't have integration with Datadog or whatever it is. You can, you can build out your own thing. And I hope that if you consider yourself a back-end person, you'll look at this and think, yeah, okay, I'm not going to become a React expert by tomorrow lunchtime. It's a big field. But I could knock up something useful internally that would put the numbers I think are interesting in front of the people I think need to see them without too much effort. If you're more of a front-end programmer, I hope you'll look at this and think, okay, I'm not going to become a back-end programmer overnight, but if I need to build up a WebSocket server that will actually get the data I want to show people, it's not so desperately hard. It was maybe two, three pages of code, right, that you can pause on the YouTube stream when it's published. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm deeply interested in what Kafka can do. The main thing it can do is stream out data to you live. It can be deeply concerned with what the latest data is. So if there are events happening right now that are particularly important because they're happening right now, I hope you'll have a look at Kafka um, and consider it as being part of your system for live real-time data in motion. And with that, I think I'll say thank you very much and stop for questions.